gentlemen, to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook, a journey into love and literature. Uh, here with the final reading of Wittershins, I am your host, Lucky. And I am Mac W. Money, broadcasting to Oh, we're both broadcasting Wait, to you live. The oh, signal's boy. coming from one phone. Is it in the house? It's the GRBN burner cell phone that I always carry with me. Wait, I thought this was only for the drugs we need to do the podcast. That's right, folks. We're both here. One of us is queer. Get used to it. And uh, a little treat for us, I would say, this week. Um, we are two for two of living authors in communication. We have reached out to Jordan L. Hawk with a little bit of fan questions of our own. And uh, he got right back to us very, very quickly. Yeah, I think we, we were sitting together having an after-dinner drink. And we thought, oh, we should, we should hit up Jordan and maybe ask. And you can tell he probably gets this question all the time. But we asked, who would you cast as Christine in a movie adaptation of Wittershins? And like... I would say I had the time to set down my phone and pick up my drink before he had immediately like slapped back with a great cat. Do you want to tell the audience who it is? Yeah. And I like how specific this was because, you know, it gave me such a visual but picture of exactly how this movie would be. Um, he said, um, Ava Green from Penny Dreadful with bigger muscles. Yeah, but with muscles. So, yeah. And I like that's, and I, you know, Ava Green is beautiful. She, I think she, as a Bond girl, uh, you know, as um Penny Dreadful, that's Penny, an incredible uh, show. No, show. that's not a, an incredible show. Lord of the Rings. I mean, we're, we're talking about a storied career here. Who is she in Lord of the Rings? All of them. She's all the elves. Have you have you seen Lord of the Rings? <laughs> she plays Feely in the Hobbit films. Under heavy, heavy makeup and muscles. Heavy makeup and muscles. But here's the issue, Mac. Christine. I mean, throughout the book, and I think we'll get a little bit into her more and the things that she's done and she's achieved. She's ripped. She's buff. She's carrying Sakafa guy out of tombs herself. She's fighting off zombies and mummies and beasts. Misogyny. She, she's got big muscles. She's got to have like really, really big muscles. Eva Green needs big muscles. She needs big muscles. And I need to see like, it, I need to see a silhouette walking to me and say, is that a three headed beast? No, that's Ava Green and her two shoulders. I love how specific Jordan was with this suggestion with the muscles. Because I imagine that he's involved with the casting process sometime in the future. Eva Green comes in, kills it, but he's like, hold up, hold up your arms. Eva Green's like, well, what? No, 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 no. Bigger. Bigger. More. Do you know what a push up is, Ms. Green? I think I would hire The Rock's personal trainer. Is The Rock his own personal trainer? I'm just thinking, who's going to get Eva Green those big, big, good muscles she needs? He cannot be his own muscle hype man, Lucky. Are you crazy? Oh, is that what Kevin Hart is for? Tia Beach bench press Kevin Hart. Yeah. Yep. And he hypes him up. He stands on top of the bar and hypes him up as he's going. Lift like, me higher, fool. Could you imagine having to be Kevin Hart in that moment? And The Rock's like, hey, look, my arms aren't getting that big. I need you to just eat a couple of cakes. And Kevin Hart's like, I have a roll coming up. Like, I really, I need to trim down for this. And there's no option. Hey, Kev, come over. I'm melting pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream again for you to sip on. I, uh, that's not good. I like the relationship between The Rock and Kevin Hart. I don't like this negative energy we've inserted into their fun, I would say maybe sometimes combative friendship. So you're saying in your dream movie of Wittershins, you're not casting Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Kevin Hart as Wyborn and Griffin. I feel like I feel like that's where the conversation has naturally gone to. Because, I, you know, and then Eva Green, bigger than The Rock. Because, again, she's got to be <laughs> big, big muscles. She busts in and she, you know, kicks the crap out of the whatever hyena human hybrid. All right, Lucky, we've heard from the author. Now let's hear from the experts. Let's cast our own Wittershins adaptation. What does yours look like in your, in your wildest fantasies? In my wildest fantasies, I mean, we're not even talking about like a true adaptation. It's going to be, mm. there's going to be a twist on it. Like, show me the animated series, right? Like, give, yeah. me, give, me, uh, give me Madhouse put in charge of this project. Like, I mean, give me an original Japanese with a stellar cast, you know, just like crush it out and then give me the American with bad casting. I want to see... Patrick Warburton voicing Griffin. I want to see Michael Sarah <laughs> voice acting as Wyborn. I want to <laughs> see Jennifer Hale as Christine. Get an old veteran in there also to balance out the goofiness of the main two. Give me some big fights, big action. I love this. So you're talking about Wittershins, the anime. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it it'd be like a Western. Yeah, I mean, like I call it Wittershinyu. It's going to have all the high packed action we have from the first one. Uh, it's also going to turn the sex scenes into a little bit more of like a battle type situation. Like, uh, as Wyborn oh. takes his pants off, it's got the, like, the really loud music and like the deep bass, like, <laughs> as the pants hit the floor. And then uh, Griffin's like, what? His speed. He's too fast. And his like, underwear is like off in a shadow. You, you've never seen the anime. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100%. The sex scenes need to be retained. That is like untenable for them to be kept. I think with any adaptation, any type of creative spin, that is the, the key. That is the core of Wittershins. You have to keep that in. It's the keystone. The Arkenstone of Wittershins. You went all out with your TV show your, with Wittershinsu. I was, my notes are like, Michael Fassbender? Question mark? I, I don't know. I just think he has that good face to, for, for old times. Um, good face for old times. Michael Fassbender. Is Edward Norton too old to inhabit Wyborn? Does Edward Norton age? I kind of assumed he's looked the same since Fight Club. I mean, he's, he's such an incredible actor. He's got the range. I am a huge Edward Norton fan. Seeing him as Wyborn is a powerful choice. He can play the kind of like closeted, cautious man, but with a gorgeous Hold face. On. Lucky, I have to stop you there because I think you just stumbled upon a little bit of a conspiracy theory because both Edward Norton and Brad Pitt are sort of frozen in Fight Club time. Now, question, hmm. do you believe that Brad Pitt and Edward Norton found the Fountain of Youth while filming Fight Club? I think maybe they found it, but now it is owned by the Hollywood Illuminati and they parcel it out. So while they still have to age, they will just die 200 years later than most people. I see. So David Fincher showed them down into the, yes. the caves beneath West Hollywood. Yes. Don't go down there, normal people. They have guards and they will attack on site. Clones of Dwayne The Rock Johnson are down there. Clones of Dwayne The Rock Johnson and botched plastic surgery patients waiting <laughs> to destroy you. Halloween is over. We have closed the book on Wittershins. What did you think, Lucky, of this highly erotic book? Well, guess it was highly erotic, verging on the pornographic. But I would say, what a complete story. And, you know, <laughs> we've read a lot of books at this point before. And some of them I feel like really leave us wanting. I felt that way with Selection. I felt that way a little bit with um, Hell, The Hell of Adventure. This is the end of a story. We have had a beginning, middle, and end. We have learned a lot about the characters, and I can see a future for them. I, I had a great time. This is a good one. It's really well structured, and it's a credit to Jordan L. Hawk to keep that pace going, 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 like from the beginning. I think this was the book that I read the fastest. Like when I started the week's reading, I usually sat and just read through all 10 or nine chapters that we were going through. But the selection, I, I liked it, but I liked it in little bite-sized pieces. I would read like three chapters a day, three chapters a day, and like get it in little segments. I kind of couldn't put this down. Uh, only thing is that <laughs> that one sex scene that like stopped and started again. And uh, we did get some spicy stuff in this section of reading, but I'll let you um, describe that. Yeah, absolutely. Let me get into the review of the book. Um, this is our final reading of Wittershins by Jordan L. Hawk. We begin our final reading, arriving at the museum the day after the robbery. Wyborn is accosted by both reporters and security staff as he arrives, with dour temperaments pointed at his heroism. Tempting the thought of abusing magic again, Wyborn escapes into the confines of his office, where a waiting griffin holds the next step to their mystery. Upon examining and deciphering the photographs of the stolen scroll, Wyborn announces the true intent of the Brotherhood, bringing about the end of the world. <gasps> Knowing that Madame Rosa is the one to set the boys up for the abandoned house murder trap, they head to the brothel again to interrogate her. However, as they approach her door, they hear the ominous sounds of something monstrous having a person snack on the other side. A man-bat monster waits behind the door, feasting on the body of Madame Rosa. Fresh off of his engagement in Gotham City, it's a man-bat. As soon as they started describing this one, I was like, ooh, 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 man-bat made it in. What a crazy DC crossover. And I imagined him like man-bat <laughs> from the Batman animated series. The description did kind of think of that little, like, long arms, long fingers, kind of wings, like skin attaching to all of it. Does still look like a human. Shit, we should have asked Jordan L. Hawk who he would cast as man-bat in a Batman adaptation. Griffin displays some Pinkerton gunplay and downs the beast, though finding no clues for the investigation. The boys head home, disappointed in their loss. As they go to sleep, Wyborn makes a stunning revelation. He's in love. The next day at the museum, Wyborn receives a summons from his estranged father to attend dinner. Fearing for his mother's health, Wyborn accepts. After a sweet reunion with his old maid and a shitty run-in with his chonk brother Stanford, Wyborn heads off to his mother's room. Wyborn has a touching reunion with his mother, where he instantly reveals magic is real to her. He spills the beans on everything so fast. That's rule 
number one. I mean, like at the very beginning of Harry Potter, don't tell people magic's real. Like, what are you talking about? And the fact that there isn't already some type of big society figuring out if magic's real, if you can learn a magic spell and instantly just show people and use it, well, it makes no sense to me. I didn't think we were even going to meet his family. And then the next thing you know, he's like throwing fireballs around the room to prove to his mom that he's a budding wizard. I mean, props to his mom for showing kind of the same worry that Griffin did, right? Like, oh, I don't know if you should be fucking around with that boy. I mean, she doesn't sound like that, but I mean, she was pretty old in my head. Sickly, older. I imagined her as like sort of like Laura Dern, but sick. Oh, oh, that's actually very good casting. Man, we were on fire with this <sighs> adaptation. Holly Weird, if you're out there. Keep us out of those tunnels. I thought it was cool, though, that the mom is worried, but also totally down with it and like delighted by the fire magic. Yeah, she loves it. She loves seeing her son happy in any sense. And I think that's very motherly of her. I think she's not quite thinking very clearly about what it means and the connection to her family. I will say that reading this chapter with his family explains a lot about Wyborns. It's like when you meet someone's parents and you see that dynamic, you're like, oh, yeah, all of their anxieties make sense now. I get it. Summoned to dinner, Father Wyborn accosts Percy of his choice to chase after the museum thieves. At least from Wyborn's perspective. Upset by this news, Wyborn heads to Griffin's after dinner, hoping some passion will fix everything. A slippery tickler spells the end of this chapter and Wyborn's loins. We've had so many sex scenes in this book. I'm not sure this one stands out above the others. Is this the one where they do a little 70 minus one? Yeah, they do. And they do it. Um, they do it in what I would say would be like the most beneficial position of both on their sides. That's very generous of both of them. Well, Wyborn was shot in the arm, so that does limit some of what one is capable of in bed. So that didn't stop them the night before when they yeah. basically broke a headboard apart and this man was injured. I, yeah, I don't true. I just don't think they care that much about the gun injury. I think that's we're past the gun injury. It's healed. They can do anything nasty they want. Got some of that sexual healing. I can't tell you how excited I am to go months in my life never having to read the sentence and he spent himself on my mouth again that is that i think was the most challenging coupling of words like yeah there was some aggressive stuff but boy that one really paints a vivid picture so much of these victorian era euphemisms are way worse than the sexual words we use today like his puffy lips soaked with spend it's like what what are you doing down there that's making your lips so puffy what is going on with the puffy lips i don't understand like uh, you know, we're experts in a lot of things, so I would say smooching is up on that list. I'm not biting lips and vacuuming that out of someone's mouth to make them puffy and infected. Is this a new health trend that they're trying out? I'll come over for a blowjob and some collagen. After experimenting with a new passion, Wyborn opens up to Griffin about his family relationship. The next morning, as Wyborn begins to work on their world-ending case, he stumbles across some notes of Griffin's with his name on them. <gasps> The ex-Pinkerton detective has been taking notes on Wyborn for the case, assuming him a Brotherhood agent and possible sodomite, seeing that as a way to gain his trust. Heartbroken, Wyborn confronts Griffin and tells him he'll finish the case, but they're dunskies. I think that the notes are really funny. There's a moment where he's like, sodomite? Question mark? Blackmail? Question mark? And it reminds me of a very funny moment in the comic book Watchmen where Rorschach is talking about all the different, you know, superheroes. And he gets to Ozymandias and he's thinking about him and he's like, superhero, both powerful, hard to kill, possible homosexual, must investigate further. And it's like, wait, wait a minute, what, you, what does that investigation entail? So I just, the idea of like profiling someone and being like, sodomite, maybe? Scale of one to ten, seven. Bangability scale, nine. Williness? Eleven. Williness? Off the charts, Kimosabi. Based off of the slight references we've gotten, it seems like their Kimosabis are off the charts. So I guess I didn't really like, when we were reading this part and Wyborn gets really upset, I understand him being upset, but I don't know, I have a hard time associating with that moment because, you know, so many of the clues are up. Like, he literally was a detective. He met him working on a case as somebody who is involved closely with the people he's investigating. So, like, yeah, I mean, that was rough, right? That would be rough to see, especially after they've been together. But, you know, he didn't take any time to see, when did you write this? Like, uh, or even ask any questions. It was just this like, moment of, wow, I can't believe you used me to get more information on the case. Has he not been there for all the other moments where they're, like, falling in love and all of this? I mean, that, 
he would be an incredible actor if that was the case. But I don't know. He doesn't really take a second to maybe give Griffin at least some benefit of the doubt. This piece of information comes before we learn that Wyborn's family, spoilers, is involved with the cult, with the Brotherhood. So that's, I think, what Griffin's goal was, is to get into the Brotherhood through Wyborn. And Wyborn, when he sees these documents, doesn't yet realize how deep, how, how almost accurate he was. Like, if Wyborn had gone to the right college and not gone to Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, then he probably would have become a part of the Brotherhood. Jordan Elhawk, you need to write an alternate reality book, alternate Wittershins, where Wyborn turned evil and Griffin is investigating him. So they still hook up, but it's like darker. There are a lot of books in the series, right? I mean, possibly. Why not book three? The portal opens to the dark universe. All four. Sexy, dark. (gasps) I'm getting chills, Lucky. (sighs) Back at the museum, Christine consoles a sad Wyborn, only to tell him she's off on another archaeological dig on the morrow, leaving Wyborn completely alone. To distract himself from his grief, Wyborn throws himself into the case. Unable to return home due to sadness, he falls asleep at his desk, working in the Arcanorum. In the morning, Christine wakes him with a start, alerting him Griffin has been arrested for the murder of Madame Rosa. That's, isn't that the end of a chapter? There's a great line. I think you, you, you basically quoted it, but it's like, Griffin's been arrested for the murder of Madame Rosa! Bum, bum, bum! That part too, like, as I was reading it, I just wrote down a note. Duh. Like, I mean, the, the whole scene, like, they go to visit her. They're told she's not seeing anyone. They pull guns on people to go and see her, break down her door, leave a messy corpse that looks like it's been eaten, and walk out the front door where people saw them definitely come and go. I thought it was a little weird that they just sort of walked out of that situation, and there were no consequences. There were no consequences. Nobody even tried to stop them. Well, I guess I wouldn't either. If somebody can pull a gun, and then I went to see the room they were in, and a like, half-eaten corpse was torn apart? Yeah, I'm not going to stop them either. As Wyborn arrives at the police station, he is surprised to hear his uncle Addison has bailed Griffin out, supposedly at Wyborn's request. Wyborn heads to his family home to confront his father on his uncle's action, only to find out his brother and father have mysteriously left for the night. <gasps> Pieces of the puzzle finally fall into place for Wyborn. His uncle, father, and brother are in the Brotherhood. <gasps> they have Griffin, and they plan to resurrect little Leander at the very evening. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, we, <laughs> what I like about this book is there's no, there's no chaff. Like, every piece of information we get has all culminated to that exact puzzle piece. I'm like, okay, the boy we know about. We know about Glenn because of the brotherhood. Like, all of the pieces that have kind of come together and woven, I'm like, oh, I don't really have any loose ends that I'm worried about for this specific adventure. No, after getting to the end of the selection and having, you know, it's the first of a trilogy. So we didn't get that satisfying conclusion. This barely sets up for a sequel. Yeah, I mean, we get a little something at the end, but like this, the book has closed on this specific adventure, and I like that a lot. We're going to take a little break from the review here to feature an organization this week. Uh, We've been featuring a different organization every week for this book and for the month of October um, who are helping out with the LGBTQIA plus rights. For our spotlight organization this week, we're featuring National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network, or the NQTTCN. The NQTTCN is a healing justice organization committed to transforming mental health for queer and trans people of color. They envision a world where all people have access to healing resources rooted in social justice and liberation to recover from trauma, violence, and systemic oppression. They specifically acknowledge the harm and violence perpetrated by the medical institutional complex and actively work to both intervene directly on this system as well as create new systems of care for our communities. They have all kinds of great resources like strategy labs and healing justice learning links. You can find out about this and more at www.nqttcn.com. Check them out. They're a really fantastic organization. We will be posting a link to that website in our episode description, as well as links to all of the organizations that we've highlighted this month for Spooky Season and LGBTQIA History Month. All right, and now back to our review of Wittershins. Now knowing the truth, Wyborn gathers Christine to plan the epic rescue of Griffin. The planning process propeller spins as we smash cut to Wyborn walking up to Uncle Addie's estate, declaring he knows what's going on and wants in. So I love that we get like a classic propeller spin, right? Like they get together and here's the plan. Page break. We're at Uncle Addison's estate. And 
you know, this is this is classic, a classic mystery de- detective trope. I like this. Uncle Addy is really happy to hear that he's coming on board with it. They actually all want him to be evil Wyborn. He convinces Uncle Addy of his trustworthiness, then runs into Blackburn. Attempting to unnerve him, Blackburn shows Wyborn where Griffin is being held. Wyborn sends him a subtle signal of reassurance as they parade about. Back among the cultists and proven of his trustworthiness, Wyborn promises Blackburn an immoral sexual carnival right after the ritual is complete. And that was an end of a chapter when he like, promises him like, this very surreal conversation with Blackburn where they're talking about the boy's immortal. We can do anything to it. Like, yowza. Yeah, they're essentially inviting like an elder being into Leander's body. So Leander will be back, but also have the power of an outer god. And the ability to participate in threesomes with uh, wizards. Yeah, this is, you know, this is where the book kind of skewed more toward the bear side of things. So I started getting a little nervous about the boy. I was like, are we going to get another sex scene in here towards the end? If this fucking boy produces tentacles, Mac, I cannot express my distaste. There was one cool little reference I want to point out in this dark ballroom scene, we might say. Wyborn notices someone dancing, uh, and this is, this is a quote. The owner of the canning factory danced with his wife. Rumor had it they were first cousins, and their identical, oddly bulging eyes seemed to confirm it. Which I read as a reference to The Shadow Over Innsmouth, where you have this sort of inbred community of half-humans, half-fish people. Uh, and so I thought that was kind of a cool little nod, yet again, to more of the Lovecraft mythos. Jordan L. Hawk does a great job folding those in very subtly where, you know, it's stage setting, but you're also, ah, I remember this from the story. Boy, I kind of passed over that part, but that really bumps me out. Oh, that they're first cousins? Yeah, just like the whole concept of that. I guess like they do flock to cultism. The Marshes have been wedding brother and sister for centuries. Wyburn then approaches his father, the final piece to his deception puzzle. His father confides his desire of youth and vibrance restored to his wife as his motives for cult lifestyle. With everyone convinced of Wyborn's good intentions, the ritual finally begins. Griffin is dragged to the ritual island in chains, knelt before a stone altar. Surrounded by cultists in iconic black robes, Blackburn chants the resurrection spell as a bolt of lightning tears reality itself apart. As the blast of light fades from Wyborn's eyes, he sees Leander, his young love, alive again. Gazing on the revived form of Leander, Wyborn makes an agonizing choice and counters the magic holding him together, hoping to close the portal. Unfortunately, his lack of knowledge betrays him as the portal stays open, causing chaos in the hybrid monsters roaming the island. Wyborn and Blackburn tussle it out as Christine, Griffin, and surprisingly Wyborn's father, fight off the monsters and cultists alike. There's that moment where Leander wakes up and recognizes his father, and then looks to Wyborn and doesn't know him. And I was kind of puzzled by that at first, but I think it's because Wyborn has aged out of boyhood, where his father, you know, between 40 and 55 or whatever, he probably looks the same, but he doesn't recognize him. And I think that's a powerful moment for Wyborn. And if Leander had immediately been like, oh, Wyborn, like I've always like if he had thrown himself at him, it might have might have ended a little differently. Mm. That's very true, because. That separation, I think, did cause Wyborn to stop from running forward. You know, when he looked at him with the confused eyes, he didn't. He stopped himself. And that kind of kickstarted the whole thought process of, oh, crap. That's right. That's not really him. And an elder god is going to be in this body. I probably should do something. And obviously, it was a tough choice for him. Um, but I think he was able to make that disassociation because of this moment where he could banish the boy to dust. Mm-hmm. In a final act of desperation, Wyborn chooses to sacrifice himself to close the portal. Griffin's Pinkerton gun skills save the day again as he clips Blackburn, spinning him into the portal as sacrifice, closing the tear in the universe. Christine retrieves the stolen scroll, and the four head off into the sunrise. I gotta say, I thought the book was gonna end here, because it was such a nice little moment. Visually, it's a great image. They got the scroll, they defeated Blackburn. Velocity Leander was a bummer, but it's okay. The brother even lived. I think Mm -hmm. the father said he sent his brother home. But we then had another chapter, and this is where I kind of tightened up. I got a little nervous. Oh, no. Uh Uh-oh. The final sexual scene. Wyborn and Christine present the stolen scroll back to the museum, reclaiming their tarnished reputations. As Christine heads off on her expedition and Father Wyborn offers begrudging thanks, 
Wyborn and Griffin find themselves at Griffin's apartment. Through tearful admissions, Wyborn forgives Griffin for the notes he wrote. Our heroes embrace on the decision Wyborn should move in with Griffin, thus ending our reading of Wittershins by Jordan L. Hoff. The way he invites him to move in, he sort of poses it like, oh, I would I need a roommate, but he would have to be like this. And uh, I like this quote. I'm very particular. The boarder would have to be tall, handsome, and speak precisely 13 languages. He must be willing to put up with a roommate prone to nightmares, occasional fits of brooding, and a fondness for chess. Must love cats, keeping odd hours, and sword canes. While it's like a fun, cute thing, like he's trying to reference himself, that is also wor- worrying me as a potential tenant. Like, oh god, so my boyfriend's a little overbearing. Imagine seeing that in the classifieds. Must love sword canes and a roommate prone to nightmares. That actually does feel like you're going to get murdered, right? Like, there is in the news article a justification for the shadow man coming and stabbing you in the depths of night. It was right there in the article. She should have been prepared. It couldn't have been me. I was brooding in the library. That wraps Wittershins up in a neat little bow. Lucky, what is your rating for this masterpiece? Monsterpiece. Wow. Well, it kind of depends on what genre you're asking monster me. Monster penis. Do you What's wanna... your rating of this monster penis? I was, I was going to ask if you wanted to isolate you saying monster penis a couple of times. Okay, yeah, let's get some clean takes for that. Yeah. Monster penis. Oh, fun. Monster penis. Monster's penis. Oh, you'll get your hand on the ball there. I like that. Yeah, sorry. Franz is speaking through me. You know, that's interesting. I'd have to say it varies on category, right? Because as a romance book, I would say more pornographic, leaning on the scale of pornography versus old school timey romance and courting. Mm -hmm. It's definitely on the pornography scale, so I would give it a six. Um, For Lovecraft adventure mystery story, I'd give it an eight. I mean, it comes together. It ties up nicely. I would have liked a little bit more development, I think. Um, as to why it's like Wyburn was making some choices, you know, obviously that'll probably be uncovered in more books, but I do feel like a lot of it was like information. Ah, here we go. Moving forward. You know, you have to keep the clip moving in a book at that size. And then as solely eroticism, I'd give it an eight because that book was nasty. So that's eight, eight and six. Yeah, it's harrowing. It's thrilling. It's sexy. Uh, if you're into gay erotica at all and horror in any way, those two things collide really well in this. So altogether, I'm going to go ahead and give it 28 erections uh, out of a possible 29. Wow. That was a lot of erections in the book, and I agree. That's uh, very close. We are not done here at GRBN, however. That's right, folks. The lawsuits cannot stop us. The crazed fans calling all days and nights. The cease and desist from Kira Cass's lawyers cannot put us down. We will be back in two weeks, Friday after next, with a new episode that might have a little snow sprinkled on top of it if you catch my snow drift that's right it's going to be a new book a new season new loves new adventures maybe a little bit more sex it's hard to say um but this is a great time to get on board start uh, telling your friends about us um you can follow us on twitter at, at gr that is also going to be our instagram handle you can send us an email if you'd like to hear from us at uh, gr at gmail.com that is a great way to ask us questions give us your recommendations just reach out to talk to us. We're looking forward to interacting with the fans, um, even though they're pounding on our windows. You know, <laughs> This is the appropriate medium to talk to us. Yeah, hit us up with that fan casting. And if you enjoy the show, please feel free to leave a review over at iTunes when we get a new one. It always makes our day. And tell your friends about the show. That's the best thing you can do if you're a big fan of the book. Oh, no. I'd like to say for the final time, thank you so much to Andrew Huang for the use of Grind, our intro and outro oh, speaking Thank you, music. Andrew. What an incredible song, dancey, bouncy. Um, I'm going to miss the energy. Oh, no, we were supposed to watch a gay movie for this week. Oh, my God. How do we forget? Uh, Let's just put on Interview with the Vampire and we'll do a live commentary for it right now. Great, 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 great. That'll be short. Mm -hmm. Start the movie. Okay, great. Hello, I'm here for my interview. Okay, okay, Max, so far it sounds like it's gay. Oh, you're a little early. Why don't you wait outside in in the waiting room there? What was your name? Dracula. Wow, they're really good with the program in this one. Is this the interview? No, Sarah, I told you you are the voice is now are completely messed up. This movie sucks, man. This is like a bunch of outtakes. Like a bunch of outtakes. This movie is. We're trying to make it all.